So I guess I like starting off with this slide because it's kind of that, uh, what do they call it, blue, blue sky, I think is the, this is a perspective that many people have when they talk about the cottage. They talk about serenity, they talk about, we don't need to worry about all the, the worries of, of back home, where, wherever that may be. Uh, if, in, if in fact we're fortunate enough to live here full time, then perhaps this means a different perspective. I mean, this is looking from the shore back to the land. But it, it's a, a picture that I like to start with because it does give an idea that what we're talking about, usually when we're talking about shoreline communities, is a different perspective. We're talking about a large lake, which is the second largest lake, uh, in, the, in the Great Lakes, and certainly uh, depending on your criteria, the second or third largest freshwater lake in the world, it's a huge body of water. It's a coast. That's the reason why the Lake Huron Coastal Center uses that in our, our terms. So the massive amount of water is something that we have to have, uh, have to keep in the back of our mind because it really dictates a lot of things that affect the shoreline, affect the coastline. The other thing is that image of Lake Huron, and just in case you're, you're not totally familiar with it, Sarnia is down at the south end. There's the uh, Point Clark area where I started off this morning. Here's our, uh, our elephant area here, Tobermory at the end, Georgian Bay, Manitoulin Island, and going up to the connection with the Lake Superior. It's a, it's a large body of water. It's one that when most people think of the lake, they think of a large blue mass of water. The perspective aspect that I'd like to suggest to you is part of the work that we do is we look at it from a different perspective. This is as if you pulled the plug on Lake Huron and it drained away, and the red is very shallow area, and the blue is very deep area. So this gives you an idea in the lake itself where we have the deepest water, where we have the shallowest water. And not totally unexpected, if we've got northwest winds, you can see where all the beach development occurs down around the longest reach across the lake, and certainly Wasaga Beach area. So where you've got that gradation going from red to orange to yellow to, to green, those are where our beaches are and our beaches and dunes. So it's not by happenstance that we have those features in these particular areas. So when we start zeroing in on the shoreline of interest, here's uh, Point Clark, here's Bruce Nuclear Power Plant, there's Southampton, there's Pipe Bay actually showing up on there, so we can assume our elephant area is right in there. And again, you can get into the details of the lake depths, which have an influence on our coastal processes, which have an influence on everything from ebb and tide of the, of the, of the water to uh, water quality uh, to all sorts of other things related to erosion uh, position. And if we get one step further again and we dive right into the elephant area, we start looking at individual contours and what does that mean. And certainly uh, some of the image, like the one off of the Dawes, <coughs> Donna's wall, and I'll just hold that up just for a minute, you can match this with that image and start looking at, okay, what does it mean to have it really shallow in one area and not so shallow in another, and then where are the areas where, because of the historic use, we, we needed to dredge and do the work that we've done. So we can start getting into those levels of detail as we move along the process of the shoreline management plan. And we're just starting that now, and I guess that's the other thing that I want to make sure that I mention to you is this is pretty much the beginning. So we're now, we're now looking at providing updates as we go along and providing the opportunity for people like yourselves who represent the community to share your ideas, your, your thoughts, and your concerns. As far as the Coastal Center goes, I think I've covered most of this. We are an ENGO is the, uh, the terminology. We're registered uh, not-for-profit. We have a lake-wide perspective. And our priorities are water quality, biodiversity, coastal processes, and climate change. And those are the four areas that we focus on as priorities. And they are all connected or interconnected. Climate change, you can almost consider that something to do with the sun. We talk about water quality, which is that blue strip. We talk about coastal processes, which could be that brown strip dealing with the ebb and flow of sand and sediments and erosion. 
and last but not least, biodiversity is usually referring to vegetation. It can also be referencing our different animal types, but certainly vegetation <coughs> and, and the uh, wildlife go hand in hand. So that's where the coastal center comes, comes from. I've already mentioned this whole idea of a dynamic environment. When we look at water levels, which is what this graph shows back in 1918 when we first started recording water levels, all the way up to, this graph goes to 2004, but we can certainly project it right up to 2009 today. And the red circles, if you can't see from the back, are just the top end. So those are our high water level times. The uh, green circles are the, the lower end, and those are the the times when we've had low water level, the lowest being in 1964, and the highest being in 1986. And again, for those people that have been cottaging or living, residing along the shoreline for years, you'll know those times right off the top of your head, because you remember that was the time when everyone was driving vehicles offshore and trying to get into their cottages and, and uh, resorts. And, and then the flip side is in 1986, I think everybody uh, who was destroying concrete foundations somewhere had a place to put concrete foundation. They were putting it along the shoreline to save roads, to save cottages. It was a, a huge emergency operation just about all the way along the shoreline of not only this lake but the other Great Lakes as well. Just because people were concerned about the high waters and the erosion that, that was occurring. And certainly from hindsight now, having about 25 years of active uh, uh, experience with shoreline management, we can see where the, uh, the, the trials and tribulations are of that approach. And certainly, we, having looked at this graph and seeing the highs and the lows, we should know better. We should know that the water levels are going to be a little higher than what they are today and a little lower than what they are today. Those are the types of things that we should be able to start planning for. And part of our coastal management uh, approach will be dealing with that and certainly bringing in some of the implications of climate change as well. This is something that I don't know whether you're aware of, but it's something that I thought I'd throw in here. Oliphant is the two slides at the top here, and this was some research that the Coastal Center was able to attract uh, a couple of people. Kevin Luckman, sorry, Tuckman is the person that did the research at the top. And this is basically showing Currently, when he did his research, which would be about four or five years ago, what the water levels look like with relation to the offshore islands in the Oliphant area. And he was projecting climate change impacts in Oliphant with this being more or less new ground, new land, submerged, or sorry, uh, areas that are no longer underwater. Similarly, Ryan Schwartz in the Godrich area, this is the Godrich Harbor, did the same kind of thing. And again, it's just putting a face to something that we all hear about climate change and the impacts on water levels. So this is the kind of thing that again, with with uh, Kevin's work, we'll probably try and incorporate the ideas of that into some of what we're talking about with the management plan. In other words, yeah, if we are accurate, there is some concern there that the water level is going to be a lot lower than what it is today. And that's something that we should have some plans for. We should start thinking about. And both those uh, reports are, are up on the Coastal Center's website, and I'll mention that right off the top. A lot of this information is on our website, and the website address is at the end of the presentation. Coastal features. Something that makes Oliphant quite unique is that other than bluffs, you've got three out of the four in your shoreline area, and that is quite unique. That is uh, something that's very unusual. You have coastal wetlands called fens. Uh, you have dunes, you have alvars, and those are very uh, rare and unusual coastal features which make, make your area especially, uh, especially unique. I don't know if that's quite a word or not, but anyway, it's very unique. <coughs> and that's the kind of thing that, again, the Coastal Center is very much involved in. So when we talk about wetlands, they are the, the, the Great Lakes wetlands are the, I call them the rarest of the rare you've heard the discussion about southern Ontario, we've lost 80% of our wetlands, something like that. The Great Lakes wetlands are the ones that are <coughs> most vulnerable. They're the ones that are the most valuable just because they, they serve all those different functions and because they are at the edge of such a large body of water, that makes them that much more important. So they provide protection. If you've got a wetland in front of you, they actually protect you from waves and, and those types of things. Uh, they are habitat and certainly they're uh, nursery for fish and they are very much the, uh, you've heard 